comprehensive exam last year or in a previous year, um, there tends to be not too much focus on the section 9, which is ethics related to assessment in the ethics exam, because they're covered more predominantly in the, ass in the assessments comp comprehensive exam. I just said ethics and assessment a lot, but do you know what I mean? Yeah. Because it's a designated section of this comprehensive exam, they don't have as much weight in, in, in the other in the, oh goodness, sorry. They don't carry as much weight in the ethics comprehensive exam because you have 50 questions that are covering the entire um, ethics code. I got that out, thank you. Not working? Oh, did you do that? Yeah, I just. Okay. I'll just use. Trying to? Okay. So, like I said, I apologize. This is going to be dry, but I can't make ethics exciting. I just haven't figured out a way to do it. Um, so, what we're going to do is go through and start reviewing the ethics code section specific to assessment. Okay? Decoding the ethics code, which is where all the information on these slides came from. Okay? And there's also a lot of good information in Kutcher and examples. Everyone uses these books, right? Mm -hmm. Just the purple one, is that Fisher? It is Fisher. Yeah, okay. It's probably the older version because the new one has clouds on it. Okay. So, psychologists base the opinions contained in their recommendations, reports, and diagnostic or evaluative statements including forensic testimony on information and techniques su sufficient to substantiate their findings. I told you, there's no way I can make this interesting. All right? But what I can do is show you how all the information contained in this ethics code, a lot of it is common sense. Like, that's what you're going to realize a lot in your preparation for ethics exam two, is that a lot of this stuff is really straightforward and so what I thought we could do is kind of go through and relate it back to like concrete examples so that it at least becomes a little bit more rich for you guys. Does that sound like a plan? Okay, so part B and you don't have to remember these verbatim, you are not going to be tested on being able to memorize the ethics code, that is not what this is about. It's about conceptually understanding what each section of the ethics code means. Okay? So, psychologists provide opinions of the psychological characteristics of individuals only after they have conducted an examination of the individual adequate to support their statements or conclusions. So, in layman's terms, you can't make an opinion or a statement until after you've given an evaluation and have some kind of psychodiagnostic test data that backs your statements. I know it's revolutionary, right? But like I said, really straightforward. So when psychologists conduct a record review or provide consultation or supervision of an individual examination is not warranted. So it's not always ethical to provide or to administer um, a battery. Who can think of an example when it wouldn't be appropriate to administer a battery or to continue? Yes. Yeah, excellent, Kim, right? Oh, repeat. Okay, <laughs> sorry. So Kim said, if in the middle of conducting your psychological evaluation, um, the client decom like decompensates and goes into a psychotic break, okay? 
that's a perfect example. A less extreme example even is if you're doing an assessment on a younger person who has a lot of behavioral difficulties and you're exposing them to tests or you start an evaluation and you're exposing them to tests and they're being non-compliant. They don't want to do it. They have a lot of behavioral difficulties. What happens if you keep trying to do the assessment? What are you, what are you doing? Does anyone? Yeah, Paul. Either their scores are going to be a lot lower and you're kind of concluding that they're not intelligent or is Yeah. Okay, so Paul said that, sorry, I have to repeat everything for the recording. So Paul said that you're going to have compromised scores, right? which aren't going to be a valid representation of their abilities and you're going to be writing a report that doesn't really reflect either the, it doesn't answer the referral question or doesn't give realistic and appropriate information about the client. What you're also doing by continuing to try to administer a battery to someone that isn't being compliant is you're, you're how do I phrase this? Sorry guys. You're actually spoiling them for future administrations. So if you keep trying to expose them to a test where it isn't appropriate to be testing them, then you've exposed them and thus reduced the reliability of and the validity of the results if someone tries to go back and test them. Does that make sense? So just say I have this kid and I want to give them the whisk and I keep going and I keep going even though behaviorally they're acting out, they're not answering any of the questions. I know that this is not going to be a valid representation of their abilities. But just say something happens and in six months' time, um, they've, well, this is going to sound stereotypical, but they've received an appropriate diagnosis of, of ADHD combined type and they're on medication and they're able to be tested. Those results are going to be impacted on because I've exposed them to a number of items on the WISC already. Does that make sense? So ethically, I've done them a disservice, okay? So it's, instead of just reading it because it can kind of sound really jargony, <laughs> it's about actually thinking of concrete clinical examples of what these mean, of what these standards mean. Does that make, does that make sense to everyone? Okay. The use of assessments. Psychologists administer, adapt, score, interpret, or use assessment techniques, interviews, tests, or instruments in a manner and for purposes that are appropriate in light of the research on or evidence of usefulness and proper application of the techniques. Ugh. Psychologists use assessment instruments whose validity and reliability have been established for use with members of the population tested. When such validity or reliability has not been established, Psychologists describe the strengths and limitations of test results and interpretations. This is a big one. This is why a lot of people don't like the Rorschach. Can we kind of see that? Have you kind of been exposed to the, um, the politics of the Rorschach yet in your classes? No? Who started the Rorschach in their classes? Everyone. Okay. Do people know about the controversy surrounding the Rorschach? No one? Okay. Are you referring to two different ideas or two different ways of scoring it? And well, yeah, okay. But a big part is the idea, a lot of the controversy surrounding the Rorschach is the subjectivity of it, okay? The MMPI, they fill out a bubble, we lay down the sheets or we enter the, we enter the results into the computer. It's objective. There is not room for any kind of interpretation other than the one interpretation that you get, right? Objective, that's what it means. The Rorschach is a projective and more subjective measure, okay? You've looked, people might code things differently. You've all started to learn how to code. Mm -hmm. When you're starting to learn how to code, have you been sitting there going, oh, is it a vista or, oh, I don't know, right? There's variation, there's individual variation based on how you see things and how you understand things. And a lot of people don't like the fact that there is so much in individual variation in how raw sharks are scored. That if we both administered the raw shark to a person and I scored it and you scored it, 
there might be some key discrepancies that are going to impact on the interpretation. Okay? So, for this reason, validity and reliability, that's why people don't like the, that's why a lot of people don't like the Rorschach. Okay? They think that it doesn't have a lot of reliability. And reliability is really important, right? That's why you always have to, usually we're taught that you have to administer the Rorschach in addition to an objective personality measure. Has everyone heard that in their classes? No? Oh. <laughs> okay. That's good practice, all right? It's good practice because then you're looking for connections and you're having more evidence to draw on, all right? Who started to learn how to write integrative reports? Okay? And so is the expectation when you write your integrative report that you're going to administer an MMPI-2 and a Rorschach? Eventually. Eventually, right? And not just a Rorschach that you're going to look for two, so that you can look for connections and patterns and qualifying information and validating information and disconfirming. A lot of people won't accept a Rorschach as a standalone personality measure because of this ethical mandate, all right? Questionable validity and reliability. Is this somewhat interesting? Mm -hmm. Kind of, not really? Okay. Psychologists use assessment methods that are appropriate to the individual's language preference and competence, unless the use of an alternate language is relevant to the assessment issues. So, if you have a person where English is their second language, you want to see if you can access the batteries in their first language, have access to an interpreter, right? Have access to an interpreter that has appropriate skills in terms of assessment and administration. And that's also including sign language, which we tend to kind of forget about a lot as well, okay? But that's fairly straightforward, right? If I have someone where they lived in Germany until they were 15 and moved here and English is their second language, and I give them the, I said they, I give them the waste in English, do you think that's going to be the best representation of their intellectual abilities? Paul says no. Who agrees with Paul? Depends on how old they are now. Uh, okay, like sorry. Um, so they lived in Germany until they were 15, they've moved here, they're 24. No one knows? I think it depends. Depends? It will depend. It will depend. And that brings into mind the importance of the clinical interview. So you want to ask people how confident they feel answering questions in English, how confident they feel in their English language abilities, okay? Okay, informed consent in assessments. Psychologists obtain informed consent for assessments, evaluations, or diagnostic services as described in the informed consent in Ex section, except when testing is mandated by law or governmental regulations, informed consent is implied because testing is conducted as a routine educational, institutional or organisational activity, or one purpose of the testing is to evaluate decisional capacity. Now an important thing to consider here is the difference between assent and consent. Does anyone know what assent is? This is a really important concept, so if you write anything down today, write this down. Okay? Ascent is when we all know that, because we're starting in our practicums and things, and even with our volunteers, that if someone isn't 18, when we hand out that consent form for our testing in our, in our um, assessment classes, who do we get to sign the consent form if someone's under 18? The guardian, right? We're handing over all consensual obligations to the guardian. <coughs> but assent is the idea of verbal acknowledgement or, con or consensual agreement from the minor, even though they are not directly responsible for formally acknowledging that consent, you still want to gain assent, which is asking them, 
do you agree to do these tests? So we, you know, whatever, sorry, I'm used to, I was going back to talking to the little girl. <laughs> The developmental, like the developmentally appropriate level for gaining a consensual, non-formal agreement from the person who's under 18 to administer the test. Does that make sense to everyone? Why do you think that assent's going to be important? Exactly. So. I just have to repeat it for the record. I'm sorry. So that's a that's an excellent answer. So just because a guardian agrees for the child to to do the battery doesn't mean that the child agrees, and that by acknowledging and um, and empowering the child to make an informed and conscious decision to participate in the process, you're trying to get the most valid results, right? So, informed consent includes an explanation of the nature and purpose of the assessment, fees, involvement of third parties and limits of confidentiality, and sufficient opportunity for the client or patient to ask questions and receive answers. Okay? Obviously, when you have us assent or assent, how much you go into the informed nature of it is different. You're obviously not going to talk about fees with 15 year old that you're testing or maybe they might even ask about it depending on their personality style but that's an important thing to keep in mind to really think of what informed informed consent you know includes does anyone do assessment at their practicums yeah so you have to go into how much testing is going to cost the estimated amount of time that it's going to take to do the assessment Okay, what the expectations and burdens are going to be on the client. That's all part of it. But that's already what you guys kind of do, even though if you don't do it at a practicum, when you hand out those consent forms for your classes, don't you usually say it's estimated this is how long it's going to take? Mm -hmm. When you talk to the individual or the, or the individual's parents, you usually say, oh, it's probably going to take about four hours, I'm really sorry. You talk about how you're not going to be able to release the test results or talk about it. That's part of informed consent. That's giving them all the access to the information that they need. You're being completely transparent with them about the expectations that they should have. Okay? So, psychologists inform persons with questionable capacity to consent or for whom testing is mandated by law or governmental regulations about the nature and purpose of the proposed assessment services using language that is reasonably understandable to the person being assessed. So the same kind of thing. Even if the person is being assessed and doesn't need to provide their informed consent, you still want to gain assent from them in order to ensure the most valid results. Okay? It's a really important concept. All right. And psychologists using the services of an interpreter obtained an informed consent from the client to use the, that interpreter, ensure that confidentiality of the test results and test security are maintained, and include in their recommendations, reports, and diagnostic or evaluative statements discussion of any limitations of the data obtained. Okay? Does that all seem pretty straightforward? Yeah. So it seems really straightforward, and I'm wondering what sorts of they would ask on the exam because I'm reading this and I'm like, oh, you know, it, it makes sense and I get it, but I assume the questions are going to be a little more like in depth and kind of tricky. Yeah. So, oh, repeat the question. Okay. Um, what will the nature of the questions look like regarding the ethics of assessment, given that everything kind of seems really straightforward? They can be a little shifty. That's why I think it's, that's why I keep saying like, really understand conceptually what each thing means, what each section means, because the questions aren't going to be presented like, oh, what must psychologists do when um, conducting an assessment on someone with questionable capacity or to consent? And the answers aren't going to be, well, they should provide uh, informed consent in a, in a language that is developmentally it's not going to look like that. A lot of times they're scenario based or like hyper like um, scenario, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, 
A vignette? Thank you, Tarot. Okay, so it's a vignette. So I was like, Dr. Zoe Brew was conducting an assessment, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, it, and it will give a lot of information, and then it will say, um, what, you know, what must she do to ensure informed consent? And it will have the options of, you know, gain informed consent from the parent and assent from the child. Or Does that make more sense? I didn't explain that really well, but do you kind of get what I'm trying to say? It'll be a vignette-based question in which you'll be given hypothetical situations about how you as the psychologist would proceed, given your awareness of the ethics code. But... I found them tricky and not necessarily straightforward. So it's important to understand conceptually what the ethics code is about pertaining to assessment and well, and the other sections for your ethics comprehensive exam, but also to really take your time reading the question. Okay, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I understand we need to know it conceptually, but what if you, let's say you knew them all, but you need to know like the numbers, like well, this is 9.0, Okay, so the question was, do you need to like know that informed consent is section 9.02 of the ethics code? No, you do not need to know that. And you won't need to know that on your ethics comprehensive exam either, okay? You don't need to know numbers. You just need to know what's in it. Okay, the use of assessments. So psychologists administer, adapt, score, interpret, or use assessment techniques, interviews, tests, or instruments in a manner and for purposes that are appropriate in light of the research on or evidence of the usefulness and proper application of the techniques. Okay? What do people think that means? Sorry. Administer... Informed consent. We did. I went backwards. I'm sorry. I hit pins with an N. Okay. Release a test data. This is a really important one. All right. The term test data refers to raw and scaled scores, client patient responses to test questions or stimuli, and psychologist notes and recordings concerning client patient statements and behavior during an examination. So those portions of test materials that include the responses are included in the definition of test data. Okay? Psychologists may refrain from releasing test data to protect, to protect a client or patient or others from substantial harm or misuse or misrepresentation of the data of all the test. Okay? And in the absence of a client-patient release, psychologists provide test data only as required. Who includes an addendum of scores at the end of their report? Yeah. Why do we do that? Because we're told to, right? So we include an addendum of scores at the end because it provides standardized scores and information, and also it provides the qualitative categories of performance, right? For people to understand. It does that without releasing any of the actual items on the test. So you're basically extracting all of the important information regarding performance so that you can qualify what you put in your report without compromising any of the items or any of or the actual battery. Okay? We never talk about raw scores, ever, do we? Why don't we talk about raw scores in our reports? Exactly right. Okay. They mean nothing if you don't know what it's being compared to or like what it does. Because psychologists and psychology students are the only people who usually, uh, and school psychologists and some MFTs, that get access to and training in the use of these tests, we are really the only people who know what those raw scores mean. Okay? And we only know what they mean because of the context in how we've learnt them over all of those years. No one else really knows that. When we put all of that 
information in, we increase the possibility of someone misusing that information. Okay? People already misuse. How many times have you heard someone say, well, I have an IQ of 147. No one's ever heard that? Someone talk about their IQ as an exact score? Yeah, I have. I've even done it, right? That's actually a misuse of test data, right? It's a misuse because we already know from our training that there's no such thing as an exact IQ score. There's that confidence interval range and we talk about your true score as this theoretical concepts that exist, we're pretty certain, 95% actually, exist within this range of numbers, right? So when I say, well, according to Wexler, I have an IQ of 153, I'm actually misusing the information because what I technically should be saying is, well, if I were to be administered this test 100 times, 95% of the time, my IQ would fall within 142 and 156, right? Maybe, I don't know, I just made that up. But that would be an appropriate use. That's why we go in and in our reports, we usually explain, hopefully, what a true score is. And we talk about confidence intervals and we record confidence intervals in our addendum of scores. Because we're trying to make it we're trying to reduce the capacity for people to misuse information. Now that's a common and pretty harmless misuse of test data, but it's still an example of it, right? Because it's actually a lie. It's actually a lie that my IQ is 143, because the chances of me obtaining that score again are very, very small. But can you see how, while that's a harmless example, things can be misused in, in a much more detrimental way, right? Does that make sense to everyone? Yes, no, maybe? Okay, test construction. Psychologists who develop tests and other assessment techniques use appropriate psychometric procedures and current scientific or professional knowledge for test design, standardization, validation, reduction or elimination of bias and recommendations for use. Okay, I'm developing a test. Uh, I think that I'm going to take the Beck Anxiety Inventory, the Beck Depression Inventory, the Beck Youth Inventory, and I'm going to look at uh, a general, I'm going to take those, and I'm going to take a few of those, uh, a few of those questions on anxiety and depression from the MMPI, because, or the MMPIA, because I like those. So I'm going to take a few of those, and I'm going to add them all together to make a new test, a new screener, the Zoe Brew Comorbid Depression Anxiety Screener, right? I've taken items that have been normed and validated and seen as reliable measures of anxiety and depression. Is the Zoe Brew inventory screener, whatever I called it, is that ethical, what I just did? And assuming that, you know, like there were no copyright infringements? What? Well, I was going to first say, well, assuming there's no copyright issues, uh, well, I mean, you have to get but I'm I'm drawing on I'm drawing on tests that already have had norms and things. So do you think it would still be do you think it would be ethical? <laughs> You're right. It wouldn't be. Okay. Because it's not just being you can't just cut and paste and extra extrapolate and think, oh well I've already normed this section or I'll just use this part of this test because I know that it's already been validated and it assesses for different things. Because we know that test construction is more than just the the nature of the items, right? It's the order of the items. It's how many items there are. Okay? That was an example from the book about how you can just make dodgy you know, hodgepodge tests and think that it's okay. Does that make sense to everyone? 
pretty straightforward. Okay, interpreting assessment results. When interpreting assessment results, including automated interpretations, psychologists take into account the purpose of the assessment, as well as various test factors, test taking abilities, and other characteristics of the person being assessed, such as situational, personal, linguistic, and cultural differences that might affect psychologists' judgments or reduce the accuracy of their interpretations. They indicate any significant limitations of their interpretations. Who integrates behavioural observations when they're writing their test reports? Hands higher, guys. These little short hands. What's this about? Hands higher. Hi. That's a lot of people. I think you're being ethical when you do that, right? Because that kind of seems like what this is talking about taking into account situational, personal, linguistic, and cultural differences. So if I'm sitting there and you just administered me the waste, and I was really anxious and freaked out, and I'm like, oh my god, oh my god. Oh, and I got a really crappy score. Are you gonna talk about how I appeared really anxious? And how that may have impacted on my performance and that my score of three on block design may not be an accurate representation of my perceptual reasoning abilities. You're going to do that, right? That's what this is. That's what this part of the, of the assessment ethics code is essentially saying. That you need to provide as much explanation or suggested explanation of the results as you can. You always want to have results in context. Results out of context mean nothing. They're bad reports, they're not very effective, and they're essentially unethical. Okay? Basically what 9.6 is saying is that test results do not occur in a vacuum and you need to provide context. That's why we take history sections. That's why if someone says in their report, oh, I really love reading and I get A, straight A's in English class, and then they get a similarity score of 19, you connect that similarity score to the fact that they said, I get straight A's, right? You're providing context for those results. You're adding evidence to the validity of those results to make it a more ethical interpretation. Does that make sense? Did you guys realize you were being so ethical all the time? Okay, 9.7. Assessment by unqualified persons. Psychologists do not promote the use of psychological assessment techniques by unqualified persons. That includes us except when such use is conducted for training purposes with appropriate supervision. Okay? That's why we can't release the test results when we administer those tests, even though some of us might. Okay? Because it is unethical because we don't have the level of training and qualification yet. Alright? That's why when we do assessment reports at our practicum, even though we administered everything and wrote the report, our supervisor signs it. That's fairly straightforward, right? Everyone gets that? We don't need to spend much time on that one. Nine point eight. Obsolete tests and outdated test results. Psychologists do not base their assessment or intervention decisions or recommendations on data or test results that are outdated for the current purpose. They do not base such decisions or recommendations on tests and measures that are obsolete and not useful for the current purpose. Okay, I work in private practice in a small community. Uh, I graduated, right? I received the same kind of training that you guys did. And let's say it's in the future, so when I got out, I'm like, oh, okay, I'm going to buy the whisk. I'm going to buy the whisk for, because I might do some assessments, you know. It's good money, right? Um, in that time, the whisk 5 comes out. Now, I only, I work in a small town. I maybe only do three assessments a year. Someone refers their child to me for 
intellectual assessment. Is it ethical for me to continue to use the, the whisk for? Why not? That's the one I was trained in. It has all those norms. It's not ethical. Paul says no. Well, it's not considered obsolete. Well, it's not obsolete, but it's outdated. Now there are some there are some situations in which outdated tests are used. I just found out the VA uses the waste three. We don't use the waste three, right? We don't use that at all, we use the waste four. If we use the waste three, we, we'd think it was unethical. But if you can provide justification other than I don't want to go out and buy that new test because it's really expensive and I only do three assessments a year, you can continue to use an outdated test. So there are caveats or this, this isn't a hard and fast complete rule. As I found out, I was very shocked. I thought, that's so unethical that the VA uses the, the Waste 3. But they have norms relative to their specific population. And they have justification for using the Waste 3. And they include that in their reports. Right, VA practicum student? Right? But um, for the test purposes, I feel like that could be tricky since we know that information, but we should Oh yeah, that was no. <laughs> Sorry, maybe I shouldn't. Maybe I shouldn't confuse you guys when you're studying for an exam. For the purposes of the comprehensive exam, you do not use antiquated tests, okay? Unless there is a valid psychodiagnostic purpose for using them. Is that a? And there rarely is. Does that make sense to everyone? 9.9, .9. test scoring and interpretation services. Psychologists who offer assessment or scoring services to other professionals accurately describe the purpose, norms, validity, reliability, and applications of the procedures and any special qualifications applicable to their use. Psychologists select scoring and interpretation services on the basis of the evidence of the validity of the program and procedures as well as on other appropriate considerations. And they retain responsibility for the appropriate application, interpretation, and use of assessment instruments, whether they score and interpret such tests themselves or use automated or other services. So basically, has anyone used the RIT program yet for scoring a roll shark? Yeah? The structural summary, yeah. When you enter it in the computer and it plugs everything out. That's an automated that's an automated service, right? When we use computer based scoring and we let a computer score our whisk or our waste, that's an automated service. What this is basically saying is that even though a computer does our scoring, we still take responsibility for the scoring. Okay? I don't know too many psychologists that ask other psychologists to score their reports, their batteries for them, but that could happen. But basically what it's saying is, if your name is on the report and you write the report, then you have to assume responsibility for all of the interpretations, whether you've done them yourself by hand in the library, whether you've done them on a computer printout, or whether you had someone else score them. Okay. Nine point ten. Explaining assessment results. Regardless of whether the scoring and interpretation are done by psychologists, by employees or assistants, or by automated or other outside services, psychologists take reasonable steps to ensure that explanation of the results are given to the individual or designated representative. Okay? Unless the nature of the relationship precludes provision of the explanation of results. So pre-employment screenings, security screenings, forensic evaluations, 
okay? And this fact has been clearly explained to the person being assessed in advance. It feeds back into informed consent. People need to know what expectations to have about assessment before you start. There shouldn't be surprises. That's what informed consent is meant to cover. But the idea is that you explain what results mean. Informed consent is also including feedback sessions. So when you guys, you don't really, we don't really get to do that when we're learning how to conduct these tests in school because we can't talk about the results with our participants, right? We have to say to them, I'm sorry, I won't be able to talk about the results with you. But for the people who've started to do assessments at their practicums or will do them in the future, what happens is when you do an assessment, after you've finished, you schedule a follow-up session with them and you sit down with them and you go over the report. You go over everything that you wrote in it. You explain what the results mean, even though they're explained in the report. You don't just say, hey, here's your report. That's unethical. Okay? And you obviously do it in a way that's developmentally appropriate. So, maintaining test security. Last, the last point. The term test materials refers to manuals, instruments, protocols, and test questions or stimuli, and does not include test data as defined in standard 9.4, all right, which was more their raw results. Okay, psychologists make reasonable efforts to maintain the integrity and security of test materials and other assessment techniques consistent with law and contractual obligations. Okay. Uh, I graduate. I decide to teach undergraduate psychology at... Mm, where do I want to teach? University of Wisconsin. Okay, so I'm teaching an undergraduate psychology class on personality. I decide, oh, I'm going to show these guys the MMPI. I'm going to show them what that's all about. I bring in the MMPI in for one of my classes. Is that ethical? No? Why not? You can talk about maybe what it does, but showing them the questions and explaining how it measures it is giving a whole bunch of people who aren't trained to give tests like information as to how it works. Okay. Yes. Perfect, right? So I'll repeat that again, or I'll paraphrase. By, by bringing it in in an effort to provide and enhance these undergraduate psychology students about different theories of personality, I'm inadvertently exposing a whole lot of people who aren't at the appropriate level of training to a test and compromising test security. There's 30 people in my class who might not necessarily become psychologists who now know what items on the MMPI look like. Okay? That's bad. You can look and you can find every single Rorschach card on the internet. On Wikipedia, with commonly, uh, commonly used responses or commonly, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Whatever. People often see a bat in this card. Okay? That's pretty compromised test security, right? That's another issue that people have with it. With the raw shot. Not to hate on the raw shot. Um, what happens if... Okay, what happens if I am doing an assessment and I'm like, the mum needs to leave and I say to her, okay, well, can I just give you these... Can I just give you this battery to fill out? at home and then you post it back to me. Is that ethical? No. People do it though, right? People do it but it's not ethical. It's compromising, it's compromising test security. 
In an ideal world, people should have to sit in a room and complete all the batteries in front of you and then leave and not be able to take anything out. Every time we photocopy a test manual, apart from the fact that we're breaking copyright law, we're also compromising test security. What happens if we lose our backpack? Okay? That's why a lot of agencies have policies where you, if you're doing testing, you can't take the protocols home with you to score because what happens if you lose them? Because even though a lot of the information is contained in the manuals, you could probably deduce a lot if you got hold of a whisk or waste protocol, don't you think? I certainly think so. So does that make sense, this last one? Right? So a question might be, um, you're providing an assessment for Joe Black. Joe um, is halfway through his MMPI and starts to feel very unwell. Um, you know, you provide or you allow Joe to take the MMPI and complete the remainder of it at home and return it during the next session that you have scheduled with him. Okay? And then you would have to answer why or why it was why it was ethical or why it was unethical. Does that make sense? What would you answer to that question? What? Unethical. Yes, unethical. All right. Now, I also included this. Um, it'll probably be touched on. Oh, so I apologize if there's any kind of overlap. But another important thing is famous test litigation that has impacted on how we think about uh, the ethics of assessment, okay? And particularly Larry P versus Riles is going to be really, really important. It'll be probably overlapped next week. I'll tell Mauricio that you've covered it now so that you don't have to go over it, okay? But these are commonly thought of as really important cases. Okay, so the first one, Griggs versus Duke Power Company, 1971. Okay, and what happened, uh, what was happening was that Duke Power Company was using a pre-employment, uh, it was a cognitive measure that was having uh, that while not directly discriminating was having an impact so that very few black people were hired by this company and predominantly white people were hired. It was taken to um, it was taken to civil court and the first concept the, the idea of job relatedness the concept of job relatedness was introduced or was found where even though the intention was not to be discriminating towards black people being employed that this assessment inadvertently created that discrimination okay the nature of the test discriminated against black people being employed at this company and so the concept of job relatedness was introduced to ensure that abilities measured by a test must be clearly relevant to prospective job duties. Does that make sense? Okay, in Larry P versus Riles, which was 1979, and it's really, 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 I can't stress how important it is to understand what this legislation means for your assessment comprehensive exam. Um, Larry P versus Riles was, um, came about because a disproportionate number of, of black children were being placed in EMR classes. And EMR stands for education, Educatable Mentally Retarded Classes. Okay? They were being, uh, those decisions were being made based solely on children's performances on Wexler tests, specifically the WISC. Okay? So what Larry P versus Riles, the outcome of that, was that African American or black children could not be placed in EMR classes, which would now be like special education classes, okay, based on standardized intelligence tests, specifically the WISC. That continues. If you're given, uh, if you're sent a referral, which is to look at any kind of cognitive performance of black 
of black children, you have to use the dust. Can't use the whisk in public schools in California. Okay? I guarantee with 87% certainty that that will probably be on your assessment comprehensive exam. It may be phrased in a way that you're sent a referral for X. Um, his teachers are concerned that he is not performing at the level that he should be. What would, um, he attends public school, what would an appropriate battery look like? And there'll be options that have whisk, rat, uh, you know, an auditory processing thing and something else. Dust, rat, something else. Okay? So no Wexler. That means no Wiat or Wyatt and no whisk. Have to use the DAS. Yeah, Paul. That's only for African American? Yes. Yes. Um, the question was it's only for African American clients. And the answer is yes. They found that the whisk and the waste um, have a Caucasian or European um, discriminative aspect. So that they're not seen to be the best measure of intelligence for non-white people but specifically um, I think I think that it's and Mauricio will go into this next more when he talks about um, intelligence testing but on average that um, I think it's that African-American people score seven points lower pretty consistently than white people or Caucasian people on these tests um, Pace versus Hennen was in 1980, and it was a very similar. Uh, it was a very similar. Well, it was basically the Illinois version of Larry P versus Riles, um, but the opposite decision was reached. They decided to continue. So, let's make of that what we will in socio-political context, okay? And then Atkins versus Virginia, which happened as late as 2002, and Atkins was a young man who murdered someone uh, and, was, and was found guilty and sentenced to execution uh, and that was overturned because they were found that he had an, a functional IQ of below 70 and so the idea is that people identified as mentally retarded which is an IQ below 70 cannot face execution for capital crimes okay Yes. Can I ask a question go back to the Larry? Larry P? Yes. Um, so I know that in private schools you can administer. You can, yes. So is there any gray area? Uh, so the question was um, in private schools, predominantly Catholic schools, you can still administer the WISC and the Wyatt, regardless of the ethnicity of the client. Um, Ethically, there's nothing wrong with that because this legislation was specific to public schools in California. However, a lot of people believe that best practice is uh, being aware of that and so any school-based competency tests, people usually use the DAS. But that's just best practice. That isn't an ethical obligation. Okay, does that make sense to everyone? So they're important legislative acts that have to do with the ethics of assessment, right? So keep in mind, um, but predominantly Larry P versus Riles. Okay, that's the most important one. Okay, why don't we take a 10 minute break?